Okay, so I'm sure there's a couple people still trickling in on the way over there, but I don't want to take any more time away from the fabulous presentation that we've got today. So welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Zaldivar. I am the program coordinator over at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Before we officially get started, we're just going to do a couple of uh, student facing announcements. One, if you haven't already, please make sure you sign in. We've got this lovely QR code up here and it's posted around the room if you ever need it. If you haven't already grabbed lunch, please feel free to do so. You can bring it on in, eat while you're here or take it with you on your way out if you're more comfortable. Um, but yeah, welcome to Tuesday Times Roundtable, where every week right here, same day, same time, Tuesdays at 1230, GC 150, we gather to discuss some of the world's most pressing issues and engage you, the students, with how we can connect these co-curricular activities outside of the classroom and the way that we live our lives. Uh, for this week, our article, you can read it at go.fiu.edu slash TTRMAR08, that's March M-A-R-08. You'll get to the New York Times article that is linked to today's session, Evolution of the Femme, from Salem Witches to Madam Vice President. As always, Global Learning Medallion students, remember TTR is one point. If you are a Global Learning Medallion student, make sure you take a screenshot of your sign-in to include in your points log. If you want to learn more about the Global Learning Medallion or any of the student-facing programs from the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, hang out at the end of the session. I, Michelle, or some of our colleagues, which you'll meet Yeni, our assistant director, in just a minute. Uh, we'll be here to answer your questions. Or feel free to email glmetal at fiu.edu. We've got a couple more events coming up, too, that we are particularly excited for. The first is... Um, the 2022 session for our New York Times speaker series. So every year we invite a New York Times journalist to come speak to you, FIU students, about the issues that are most pressing to you. This year we are uh, honored to have Maya Salam. Salam, right? You can register. Salam, yeah. Salam. 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 That's what I'm thinking. Uh, you can register for this fully online event. This will be completely online via Zoom at go.fiu.edu slash NYT keynote. Uh, this event is going to happen on March 22nd from 3.30 to 4.45 p.m. Any questions, again, hang out and we can answer them for you. The other big event that we've got going on a little sooner on March 16th, we're having a follow-up to a discussion that we had our first session on last week. Don't worry, it's not a prerequisite. Feel free to come. It's going to be a discussion on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the global implications that that has. That's hosted by the OGLI in conjunction with Sigma Iota Rho Honor Society. Uh, that's going to be at 3, 6, on March 16th, again, completely via Zoom. And you can register at go.fiu.edu slash Ukraine. If you've opened up that New York Times article for today and you hit a paywall, no worries, I got you. As an FIU student, anyone with an at FIU.edu email has access to a free digital subscription to the New York Times. If you haven't already... Um, subscribed, you can do so at accessnyt.com. It'll ask you for your graduation year and some information for you to sign in. And then you'll have that paywall gone while you're a student here at FIU. If you have any further questions, you can see on our website, goglobal.fiu.edu slash students, and you can get some more information on how to access that. So for our introductions today, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to the pro here. Our assistant director Yanni Simone is here to do our introductions. So Yanni. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, I see familiar faces. Hi, Sophie. It's been a while. So hi everybody. My name is Yanni Simone. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the assistant director over at the Office of Global Learning. I manage the Global Learning Medallion program, so I see a lot of familiar faces, but if you don't know the GLM, please uh, come chat with us at the end so I can get you enrolled. I know um, these women hold a special place in my heart for many reasons. I'm on witches. They send a lot of students my way, so thank you so much for that. Um, and I just have the honor of presenting them today on a topic that's also really dear to my heart. So... Uh, I almost dropped my mic. <laughs> um, first, we have Grisel de Elena, who is a faculty fellow for the Honors College and adjunct professor of religious studies and the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at FIU. She's also an academic advisor for the Honors College and PhD student at the School of International and Public Affairs at FIU. Her research interests are in Buddhist violence, 
<clears throat> Women and Religion, the Rohingya, and International Response to Conflict. She serves on the board of UN Women USA, Miami, leading the Young Professionals Committee. Grisel also volunteers as a mentor for the National Bullying and Suicide Prevention Nonprofit, National Voices for Equality, Education, and Enlightenment. Please, um, let's give her a warm welcome. And we also have Nurka Marquez, who is an artist researcher with a wide range as a creator and performer in film, site-specific work, and stage performance. Her work has been commissioned by and presented on various curatorial platforms in Europe and the US. She is a Guild certified Feldenkrais. Mm -hmm. ah teacher and integrates the principles of the Feldenkrais method as well as other somatic approaches to her artistic and research practice. Marquez is the recipient of numerous awards for both her artistic creation and her research, including Dance Miami Choreographers Award, Gilman Fellowship in Choreography for Graduate Studies, Two Ford Foundation Travel Grant for Research in Cuba, granted through the Cuban Research Institute and the Latin American and Caribbean Center at FIU. It is such a pleasure to have them today. I promise you, you're going to have a blast because they, on their own, are amazing. When they're together, you're, at, you're in for, for a treat. Thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know how long we'll last sitting, but we're going to attempt to start this this way. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is um, this particular topic um, is one that is very near and dear to both of us. Um, I uh, personally do a lot of work in the community, both here and nationally, in uh, issues of um, accessibility and equity particularly for women, particularly in queer communities. So um, this is, this is deep-seated in my, in my uh, consciousness. Um, we were asked today to talk about uh, the article uh, in the New York Times, which was really a response to an op-ed printed originally in the, in the um, Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal, thank you. I was like about to say Washington Post. I was like, no, it wasn't the Washington Post. W S G. Yeah, the, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. Yeah, um, and uh, it was. How many of you got a chance to read the New York Times article? That's okay because we're okay, going to overview worry. it anyway. Yeah, we're going to tell you about it anyway. But you know, just want to get a sense of where we're at. Okay, anybody um, read the original op-ed in the Wall Street Journal? In terms of uh, Epstein calling Epstein, Dr. Okay. Biden Jill. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jill, baby. Uh, kiddo. Jill, sweetie. Kiddo. Yeah. Um, kiddo. Anyway, so <laughs> let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, so we're going to be discussing the New York Times article because we definitely want to get into some of the 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 background, right? Um, one of the one of the things that you know we think is super important to look at is what are the sources, right? Who is it that's writing this, right? And and what's their background? What's their trajectory? Um, and this one's a ham. So, um, in the original, okay, so Joseph Epstein, original, the original article in the, uh, Wall Street, uh, journal was basically, um, him, his rant, right, about why he believed, uh, Dr. Jill Biden should drop the doctor ahead of her name, right? And, um, basically in his, we know he called her kiddo, um, among other things. And his, the quote is, it sounds and feels fraudulent, not to say a touch comic. So I want to engage you guys from the very beginning. A touch comic. So can I ask why we're all here? <laughs> I mean, that's my question, you know? Why, why, pursue, why pursue a higher ed degree? Why even begin to speak about, right, the, the, a PhD? Why put yourself through that torture, right? If it's if it's comedic and that's and that's how it's going to be perceived, then why even do that? Now, what's really interesting is um, another quote that he that he says, uh, where he says, you know, uh, a wise man once what was that? A wise man once says that nobody should use the term doctor unless he's delivered a baby. Yeah. Excuse me, she has. <laughs> so, 
the 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 biggest issue here, right? And I think this is we live in a time. Let's let's just put all the cards on the table, right? We live in amidst cancel culture. We live amidst very serious policing that oftentimes keeps us from having conversations, meaningful conversations and discussions, right? Um, and so the first thing I want to to point out and discern is the fact that the issue with the article is not his opinion. Personally, you can think whatever you want about his opinion, right? To me, it's not even on the on the board, right? But the issue is that he doesn't really present a case for this. He attacks her on a personal level, right? And so if the argument is for the inefficacy of the use of the term doctor, when we're referring to a doctor of education, right? then it should have been an op-ed about the system that provides those degrees for those doctors of education, right? Instead, what we're looking at is at a direct attack at her person, right? And on a broader scale, a direct attack at women in general, right? It becomes very, very, very evident in the way he positions himself, in the language he uses, in the use of pronouns attached to particular sentences versus the pronouns attached to others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera right? There's a, the list, it's a laundry list. It goes on and on and on and on. Now, he also, one thing to point out in case you didn't know this, he also has a very long history of writing articles with this kind of tone, not just attacking women, okay? In another article, I mean, he has a something like a 30-year history of articles that you can go back to um, of, of similar attacks, right? And when you look at them, I have a, a painter friend of mine who used to say, you know, if you look at one of the, he had a, a, a series that were a series of drawings, right? And they were portraitures with some element, right? Some sort of like identifying element of the person, right? So there was this one little girl with a broken passport next to it. And there was another older woman with, you know, a whole bunch of like file sheets. And, and these were all drawings, right? And he said something to me as we were looking at it. And he said, you know, when you look at one, it's just one. When you look at all of them together, you begin to see the story, right? The same thing happens with these articles. When you start looking at all of these articles together, you start to get a sense of where this guy sits, right? Um, and it becomes very evident that the tone is coming from a place of a, uh, a, a reactionary place, right? Seated in fear primarily, right? Because we do understand that this is where most of these issues come from, right? It's the fear of the other. It's the fear of being ousted. It's the fear of being displaced. It's the fear that comes with folks who, due to gender, due to class, due to positioning of whatever kind, right? Hold particular positions of power or perceived power in some cases, right? Where there's a danger of being called out, right? And, and somebody pointing out that maybe you're not the one that's best suited to be speaking to this, right? So we do understand that that's part of the conversation. Now, one thing I do want to land in the room is the fact of the, the etymology of the word doctor. Does anybody know what the word actually means? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so hence, now we can all go home, right? And just kind of go, all right, you know, that, that was a moot point. The origin of the word itself, okay, is one who teaches. It's a teacher, okay? The term doctor to identify a medical doctor did not occur until a few hundred years later, right? Or I think a thousand years, something like that, after it was first coined. So the term originally comes from the idea of someone who teaches, right? And the term doctor was basically somebody who had enough knowing, knowledge, understanding, okay? This wasn't just a an accumulation of facts, right? It was an understanding where linkages could be made between ideas, conversations could be had. You know, it was really in the origins of the roots of it are in philosophy, right? Philosophy and education. So the fact that he has an issue with the use of this term also says to us, he didn't even bother to become informed about what the term actually means, huh. right? So the, the crux of this sits in, then what is his argument? Then what is fueling this? Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Grisel so she can discuss the New York Times response. So essentially this. the New York Times article just goes over everything 
you know, and obviously critiques it in defense of Dr. Biden, right? Um, however, let's point out some things. Yeah. So we're talking about a white male who is 83 years old who wrote this article, because that's important. That's important information, right? Um, and I'll tell you, I, in my own experiences, I'm a blue haired lady covered in tattoos, right? And I teach anywhere between two and four classes per semester. I advise 40 hours a week. I am a part-time PhD student. I am on the board of UN Women. I do volunteer work with teenagers every chance I get. And I'm a single mom. Nobody pays my bills. Everything I do, I have to do it on my own. I did not grow up in a house. I was a high school dropout by the time I was 15, right? So when I'm sitting in these spaces in my PhD program, where all we're doing is going over the theories of white males and what they think this world needs to do about all the problems that people of color have, it's very frustrating, right? And many times, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and preface this with, I love FIU and I would not be here if I did not love it. But you can love something and also find the flaws within the system and, 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 and do things like this to try to bring awareness to it and work on it and make it better, make it more inclusive, right? So I don't want for the things that I'm saying to come off as like, yikes, she hates her PhD program. I don't. I love my PhD program and I have some great support there. However, there are many times because of the space that I'm in, that is politics, right? With a bunch of white males, predominantly white males, <laughs> or males, period. <laughs> um, there's a lot of pushback. Um, I will be sitting in a classroom where myself and another colleague who, you know, has also an administrative position and teaches, they will call him Professor Blah Blah Blah, and they will say, and Grisel. Griselle's a PhD student. Griselle's a lot of things, but yes, I'm also a PhD student, you know, and it's, it's, it's constant, you know, or, oh, this person, professor, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there going, what, none of us have our PhD. So what, what is the difference here? Right? So we see that a lot and it's the dismissiveness, the dismissiveness because of my gender period. It could be because of my tattoos. It could be because of my blue hair. I mean, who knows, right? Uh, people make prejudgments and whatnot for many reasons, but either way, these spaces are very, very common for women and especially in politics, right? Um, so essentially when I read this article, I was just like, wow, this is like our experience every day. Many times, for example, I decided to go into a PhD program in politics because I am passionate about eventually creating some kind of policy to focus on the specific group of people that I focus on, which are the Rohingya refugees in Myanmar, right? And I have been trying to bring light to this situation since 2013 because they are Muslim, they are people of color, there has been a genocide against them, and nobody wants to acknowledge it. Nobody wants to save them. Nobody wants to take responsibility for them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And a lot of people don't even have the power or resources to take care of a situation like this because there's a million of them, right? So that is what I have set out to do. And I love to work in the field. That is, I've been to Myanmar. I've worked with the terrorists. I've been to Bangladesh to work with the refugees. I've been to Thailand to work with the orphans. I mean, you name it, I've been on the field. I've had the experience, right? Will I ever experience what the refugees have experienced? Never, right? But I will have a male who has never left the country to do any kind of field work in their field whatsoever. But because he Googled a couple of PDFs or searched up a couple documents in the FIU library, he thinks he knows more about my topic or about international relations in and of itself when you've never even spoken to a person who has been directly affected by this or is creating the situation at the very least, right? Because it is always, you know, it's easier to get access to government officials and stuff like that because, you know, they love the attention. But either way, there's a lot of dismissiveness about this stuff, right? And 
I've noticed that it happens more often to women and especially in, in, in the departments that are predominantly male, you know, fields like law, uh, criminal STEM, every, it's that, I mean, <laughs> almost every field, right. Is almost every field. except education. So I went into politics because that is what I want to do. Dr. Biden went into education because that is what she wanted to do. My degree is focused on politics. Her degree is focused on teaching methods, right? So I could probably learn a lot from Dr. Biden about how I could be a better teacher because that is her expertise, right? She is a doctor of education. So why would, when I get my PhD, why would I call myself Dr. Elena and not call her Dr. Biden because I, because mine is a PhD and hers is an EDD. It just doesn't, I don't. Well, there's a bigger conversation. <laughs> there's a bigger conversation there. So I come, I come from the world of the arts, right? Um, from dance specifically, where uh, most of the moving bodies are female and most of the ones directing those moving bodies are male. So the conversation about power and power dynamics for me is not that different. Okay. And I'll share with you a little story, which of course locks right into this. I um, went to Jacksonville University, a predominantly white private university. I was able to go there, not because I could afford it, but because I got a fellowship to go there. Um, they were in year six of their MFA program, which is the terminal degree in the practice of, the, of, of dance, um, choreography specifically. And I, they had had a disproportionate amount of uh, male fellows and were, uh, were looking to diversify the pool. So I became their token female Latina, right? Um, cause tokenism is real and particularly in fellowship programs. And um, that's a whole other, we can have a whole other lecture about that another day, right? Mm -hmm. And the implications of, of that. And I remember sitting in the office of the director the first day that I arrived at White Oak residency. Um, and she said to me, I am so excited that you're here. Notice this, because what we're talking about here is power dynamics, okay? And the politics behind those power dynamics. So she says to me, we're so excited to have you. And I was like, oh, I'm excited to be here. She said, because you know, you know this program got started originally with David Parsons, who's a really well-known choreographer, right? White male choreographer. Um, of the line of Mark Morris of, I don't do political choreography because the body can be neutral. Not when you look like this. Um, and so she says, cause you know, we've only had, well, we did have one other woman that was a fellow, but that was the second year. And you know, that was David's second year. So she was actually just really somebody that we needed who could just kind of be quiet and go through the process. Think about this for the second. Because she says, oh, I missed this part. We're so excited to have you. Finally, a woman fellow and a Latina at that. <laughs> Checking off the boxes. <laughs> so when she said Look at to us, me. we're diverse. Exactly. <laughs> so when she said to me, we have a, you know, we had one and she, we just needed her to kind of, you know, come under the radar, kind of go, you know, glide under the radar. I thought to myself internally, of course, I said, this woman has no idea who she's brought into the room. <laughs> She seriously has no idea who she's brought into the room. My work became during those two, two years about making sure that the other black and brown female choreographers were able to graduate because all they faced were roadblocks. And all the roadblocks they faced were about this. They were about, oh, but your methodology is not aligning. Well, you're asking me to incorporate research methods that have to do with dance history of a Eurocentric dance, and I'm talking about Mexican folklore. That's why they don't align. I'm coming up with my own. This was one who, by the way, graduated thanks to the fact that four other women in the program sat with her and worked on her thesis with her because they blocked her so much throughout the two years that by the time it came to the time of the thesis, she could barely think. She could barely speak without like just completely falling apart. That was one. There was another thesis where this woman was doing this incredible work to look at Afrofuturism in contemporary choreography. 
she was told that that was a literary technique and could not be applied to choreography. Think about this, okay? Think about this. Meanwhile, they had had two other black fellows, also men, who were asked to simplify the racial conversation. Simplify. This is, these are the things, and we sit here in shock, right, when we say this out loud, but these are things that happen all the time. I have a student right now in, in one of my classes, who Rosella has also had, who was ready to do her thesis for her BFA. And when she said that her topic was looking at racial discrimination in classical ballet and racial profiling in classical ballet, the response she got from the committee was, but why would you want to write something like that? We like you so much and we've given you so many opportunities here. And this is what this article is about. The issue is not the fact that some older white man went on a rant and spoke a bunch of ridiculousness, okay? Without looking at the roots of words, without aligning it, without really having a conversation about what his issue is. The fact of the matter is that this is predominant everywhere you go with very few exceptions. And it's so socially accepted. And it's accepted because it's part of the fabric, okay? It's how many times, women in the room, how many times have you been told when you're getting ready to an interview, make sure, if I, if I had a dollar for every time I've been told, make sure you straighten your hair before going to that interview, right? Because somehow straightening my hair is somehow what looks professional, right? Oh, or I'm told, make sure not to wear red, right? Lord forbid that you call too much attention to yourself. Needless to say, I wear my hair curly and red lipstick every time I go to an interview, <laughs> okay? Because look, if that is what you're And I'm using, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. When was the last time you had to go to an interview? Because you have secured everything in your life for a long time, Okay. Well, there's, 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 yeah, there's that, <laughs> there's that. I'm, I'm somehow always the one that gets, oh, girl. I'm, I'm usually the one that gets hired because they want to diversify or they want somebody who, no, yeah, this is every, every time I've been hired for every position I've ever held, there's always some commentary about either diversity or about the fact that because of my area of study, it makes me so unique which is in essence, you have no idea what I do, but it's nice language to get you grants. Yeah. And then when you actually have me in your office, you're freaking out because I'm actually calling you and trying to hold you accountable yeah. for the thing you asked me to come in here to do. And then I'm called challenging to work with. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah. So <laughs> why this all brings me to why a course like this, right? Why a course like Evolution of the Femme, right? From which to Madam Vice President. Oh, because that's when I click to the right. Click. Yes. So... <laughs> Why a course like this? Why in this current climate, right, would there be a course like this? And I have to say, I also teach a course called Radical Female Voices, in which um, I have in the past had issues with, uh, I had an issue with a male student who said, the problem is that the opinions in this class um, don't align with my, with my morals, and so that's why I'm not showing up to class and participating. And I wrote back and I said, I'm sorry, in your syllabus it states that Attendance and participation are part of your grade. As of now, you're failing the class. If this was going to be such a challenge, I really suggest that you should have probably picked a different class. Radical female voices. Radical Did we read female the voices. Right? No. And here's the thing. And here's the thing. Courses like this, when we design these, it's not opinions that we're giving. We're stating information that is, hap that is documented. Right. And if, when we provide our opinion, like, our, I mean, we always give that caveat, like, hey, you know, what did I say about, hey, I don't want you to think, you know, this is my opinion. It's not that every department at FIU is like this, blah, blah, blah. No, we but, always do but that. There is, but We're professional. But it goes back to this conversation about the doctor in education, right? And it being a teacher. If I'm a teacher, I need to first and foremost have the capacity to sit on both the sides of the argument. I need to be able to speak to both of them. I need to be able to look at what are the root causes of both of these sets of opinions and what are the bigger systemic issues, right, that have gotten us here. When we look, we cannot look at something like women in politics today without going back to the beginnings of primitive accumulation, the beginnings of capitalism, the identification, the, the demonizing 
of women who, who sat outside. Okay. And this is, this is all things that are documented. You don't have to take my word for it. Okay. It's all documented. I'm not making any of this up, right? The, the use of terminology and the change of particular use of terminology over time in order to solidify particular behaviors. Okay. In evolution of the femme, one of the first things that we look at is precisely this idea of primitive accumulation, the beginnings of capitalism, right? We go from a system and I'll, I'll you know, and, and Sophia's going like this, you know, they were in the, when I presented this part of the, this lecture in the course, and we didn't start here, this was about three weeks in, all five of them just went, wait a second, and like heads exploded, right? Because what happens in the period, and by the way, this isn't something that happened over 50 or 60 years, okay? It took a couple hundred years for it to begin to establish itself. You're basically looking at systems that went from either traditional ideas about the way class structures were set up, right? Namely, and even without getting into all of that, you had a piece of land. You worked on the land. You grew your own food. You ate from what you produced. You bartered with your neighbor for whatever was missing, right? Now, all of a sudden now, your land gets taken from you. Okay. And you're told now you're going to go and live in this other place. You're going to come and work for me, the person who now owns the land. You're going to work on the land. You're going to go back home. And then for a price, you're going to purchase what is, what is produced in that land. Did you know that there were hundreds of people who were sent to the gallows at the beginnings of primitive accumulation because they refused to work? You go from a cyclical system. Okay where there is a connection to the land, there is a connection to the way things work. There is, you know, it's, uh, if, how many of you in here have uh, read uh, Harari's Sapiens or know Harari's theories about humans and the fact that we have, we hold both objective reality and fictive reality simultaneously. And that's what has allowed us to survive. Okay, so look him up, Harari. His theories have, you know, pros and cons, but the base, basis of it, and we all understand this, right, is we live with objective reality. There's a bottle, there's water in it. If I drink it, I'll hydrate, right? And fictive realities. This bottle is more sustainable than the one that's plastic. That's not fictive, right? We know that to be true, but the person producing the plastic is saying, but that makes it easier for you. Okay. Or the other fictive reality, money, right? How many of us would argue that if you give somebody $20, you're giving them $20, right? In reality, you're giving them a piece of paper. Try giving a monkey $20 to give you his banana. Good luck with that one, right? Good luck with that one. Or you say to the monkey, give me this, this banana and I will give you a hundred in exchange. The monkey's gonna look at you like you're crazy, right? I'm holding the banana, this is gonna feed me, I'm hungry, it's taking care of the problem, okay? So we go from a space where there is a direct connection to what is happening, okay? And a direct profit to me, not financial, but profit to me, to, to a, a positioning where someone else is now telling me how this system works and what needs to happen in that system, okay? The first thing that needs to happen in that system for it to work, or, the, or one of the things that needs to happen is you need workers. And how are workers produced? How do we get more workers? Exactly. So what do women's, so what do women's, what do women's bodies become? Baby exactly. Right? So we need to sterilize this whole thing now. We need to stop having babies. Trust it. me on this. Okay. <laughs> Don't do Don't it. Don't trust her on it. Okay. So you have to, you have, you have to dehumanize, right? There has to be a dehumanizing of that body. Okay. In order to turn it into a product driven thing, right? Whatever you want to call it. Cause there's a whole list of, of, of nouns you can use, right? So now we have a break in the connection to the importance of that activity, okay? To the value of that activity, because now that activity is being placed externally, and now that is the only activity that matters for women in that system, right? And we need to go through the labor process fast so that we can get you back on the line, right? And then you can get back to working on it on the next worker, right? So this is a long history. We're condensing this in like 10 minutes, right? But right. this is, take the class if you want the, the details of it. But the essence of it is we now have a system where the value of the work done by women, ya voy, 
the value of the work done by women, right, now has very different classifications. And then the value placed on their success, on their achievements, on the things they are able to do that sits outside of the prescribed is now questionable, right? Turn it over to you for so, what happens now in the public sphere. Um, so the problem, the biggest problem that we have is that women are, number one, we've only had the opportunity to do the things that we do and achieve the accomplishments we achieve in academia and in the workforce for 100 years, 100 years, right? And let's be real, 100 years for white women, right? Um, it's It's very different. And of course, I'm talking about the context of America, the United States, not even America, because America is this whole entire country. The United States. The United States, right? So within the context of the United States, we have white women in the 1920s. You know, they were able to vote. Things started moving. Things started changing. But not for black women, it was 1964. Uh, Latina women, 1972. Um, indigenous women, I don't remember the number, but it was... I was floored when I realized that theirs was like actually I think in the 90s. And I could be wrong. You might want to fact check that. Um, but the point is your race matters, your class matters, your gender matters, right? So that's why right now this whole trans, uh, what's it called? Um, transsection, uh, trans, oh my God. Intersectionality. Intersectionality is so important in feminism because for a hundred years, we've been leaving certain groups out of everything, right? So it's fundamental that the ways that we produce all these opportunities and all this, that we really give everyone an equal chance. Because the reality is men have never given us an equal chance, right? And now they say, oh, but you have all the rights you want. What are you talking about? What are you talking about is that I'm still a hundred years behind you. You've been doing this and you've been facilitated to do all of this for years, where I've had to overcome certain barriers, not just as a woman, not just as a Latina, not just because I was poor, not just because I decided to put some tattoos on my body, right? Not There's so many different reasons. And then there's the, oh, but well, you know, maybe if you weren't a single mom, well, why am I a single mom? Do you think that I made that choice? No, I was forced to make that choice. I did make a choice, obviously, but I was forced to make that choice. Nobody sits there and says, oh man, you know what I want to do? I really want to, I really want to do like a PhD program, work like 60 hours a week and then raise these ingrates for like 20 years. It's going to be so much fun. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Right. I hope he leaves me. No. Right. So we don't have the same, the, the, the playing field is, has never been even, right? So that's what we're trying to do with this class. We're giving opportunities for number one, learn your history. Let's figure out how we can empower women. And then the, the course, we go over all these wonderful components about women's histories from Salem witches all the way to Madam Vice President, right? You and Madam Vice witches. President being a woman of color, right? It's how, how empowering, how great. Whether, I mean, you know, whether, Personally, she may be, you know, something. I don't care. I don't care about her personal life, right? Um, I, I, I care about being able to know that there are women of color that look at her and feel empowered by her because they see themselves in her. It's about representation. Yeah. It's about representation at the, at the end of the day. So and within this class, we have a ton of internships that our students have to apply to. And the whole point is that we take a trip to D.C. We take a trip to New York to get to know the context of uh, the global sphere in terms of U.N. and women's roles in the U.N. and women's roles internationally. And then we take a bus down to D.C. and all the students in the class get to engage with women in Congress and women on the Hill, period, right? And not necessarily just Congress, I mean, all types of positions. And it's facilitated by FIUDC and every single person in that class. And by the way, there's a male in our class too. So it's not just, you know, but the course, of course, the material is about women. Um, and all the institutions that we visit in DC are about pushing forward women's space in society. And this is something that's really important to understand, and it's it's the argument I had with that one student. You know, it's not just about women. 
like if we're if we keep thinking about this as oh it's a women's it's it's a problem for women no it's not it's a problem for all of society yeah it's a problem for all of society because as long as we are leaving space to question the validity of any member of society we're not getting anywhere no nope. we're not getting anywhere. and none of that bs about what if she was your daughter? What if she was your mother? What if she was a human? What a woman doesn't have to have a role of nurturer or victim or kid sister or whatever it is to be respected. I that to me is so these, because appalling. These are, because these are all structures that we carry from too many years, hundreds of years of women being considered property. Like the fact that we forget that that's where it began. Till 1920, we were property. The fact that we forget that we were part of deeds, handed over, passed over to other male relatives. <laughs> Until we understand that, and guys, it wasn't that long ago. We're talking about 100 years. That is still deeply ingrained in the fibers, okay, of the systems that we live in, okay? And when I say systems, I'm not just talking about the generic term of system, when we talk about intersectionality, it's not just a word that we throw around, okay? What is intersectionality? It's about looking at the intersections, right? Where does race and class cross, right? Where is there an overlap, okay, in these huge circles, right? Where do they bleed into each other? And how do we find common ground as a result of it? Okay. How can we sit in the really difficult questions without simply spitting out jargon or spitting out made phrases, right? And using them to dismiss getting into the nuts and bolts of the conversation and understanding that, you know, Grisel pointed out earlier that we're having this conversation about this here in the U.S., but yes, we're having it here in the U.S. because of the focus of the class, right. but this is a conversation that needs to be had the world over. And when we integrate materials from other uh, cultures, right, in our courses, we take great care to consider the totality of that existence, okay? So the same way that we're talking about, we can't just look at these things and say, oh, that's just men being men, right, and dismiss it that way. No, we got to look at the deeper, the deeper issues, right? And what are the small, tiny little threads that we don't realize are woven into it that we do have control over? Right, and the, that we do have a say about. So, um, I mean, we're actually one minute prior to our cutoff. Right. So, so um, we wanted to leave the last fifteen minutes for an open discussion. We actually had some questions that, if you know, you would like to um, address, we would love to hear about it. I mean, any kind of questions or comments are welcome. One thirty. Sorry, That's but. Really bad. That's no, fine. 15 minutes for okay. talking. Okay, okay. Yeah. I thought so, we were done. Okay. Something that Nudka posed was that she would like to know from the audience was what is the true positioning? What is the true positioning of women in society? In your opinions. In I your opinions. Hear from your experiences, in your opinions. What 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 jumps out at you? Like either from the New York Times article or from this whole back and forth of, you know, she should drop a doctor or some of the material that, that we've talked about. Like what is what is your sense? And I want you to please feel like you can speak in this space. Um, people speak about safe space. I, I work with at-risk youth, at-risk queer youth, so I don't use safe space. Me too, and I always I choose use, violence, so I got I, your back. Yeah. I, use, I use brave space, which means we're brave enough to ask the questions that we're really thinking or speak the things that are on our mind and then be willing to respect each other and lead with compassion and, and listen to each other. So yeah, what, what is, in your opinion, what do you think is, why even have this conversation right now? Right. And some people just argue with like, oh, you know, like the Biden would pick her because it was Identity politics, right? Exactly. So it's like, are we really celebrating her for her work? Oof. Because a white man said, I need a woman of color next to yes. <laughs> So I feel like that's how some people always see it. It's like, always like, go side piece of the house, never the head. Oof. Like, always the compliment and the accolades. It's like, it's always a male that. president of our universe. 
Okay. Yep. With, with, with a white Oof. Again. I love this. So I love I love that you're saying that. You know, I love that you Oof. you're saying that because it makes me think of uh, Stacey Abrams. You know, um, in Georgia, and and who are these women that are, you know, on the ground and changing the way politics looks? I have I have my own personal opinion and issues with Kamala Harris. Okay, knowing where she's come from, knowing some of the some of the changes in prison systems that she backed, I have some serious issues. How many black do men I she now, put in prison? Do I now see? <laughs> yeah. Do I, but do I, however, can I, however, appreciate the fact that it is representation? Yes, I absolutely can. Right? So those, those spaces of understanding, how do we navigate that? How do we navigate? Because we can very quickly get into the, the conversation about, well, we're just side pieces and just kind of, again, it's this, this way of speaking of just, let's just blow it off because there's nothing we can do about it. Things are much more complicated than that, right? Uh, please do to speak, yes. It's just because I feel that my voice is breaking a little bit, but it's because I'm full, so it's okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. Um, but you bring on an amazing point because recently I had an encounter in a class. By the way, just like yourself, I love the you. Would mm -hmm. not be where I am if it wasn't because of this work. Absolutely. Of fantastic faculty members and administrators. We still have some issues. <laughs> yeah, we've got some serious issues. I am the only cisgender woman in the class, and I say that because I recognize my positionality and my benefit of being a heterosexual woman in society. Mm -hmm. I am in a graduate program. I'm in the PhD program in international relations. I'm the only female sitting in that class, and oh, I am, wow. and I'm sitting in the class. I'm not even enrolled. Mm -hmm. I already have taken the class, but you see, I'm just refreshing my knowledge. In one of the assigned books for this class, which, by the way, was edited by two males, and the components of the textbook are written by various authors, but those authors also have to be reviewed by other editors. So there's like three levels of checking of what gets published. Correct. Mm -hmm. One of the articles in there was talking about the relationship between Obama's policies with uh, Christina Fernandez Kirchner, which was a pres female president of Argentina, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The author was making many historical reference points. And the thing that called my attention was that he referred to Barack Obama as President Obama or Obama, <laughs> or to Fernandez de Kirchner as Cristina. And then the cherry on top, I'm Nicaragua. <laughs> 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 uh, there has only been one female president in Nicaragua, Violeta Barrios de Chapon. He referred to her as Violeta. Oof. And then De Chamor. So not even her last name. Mm -hmm. De Chamor. Mm -hmm. Not Barrios, which is her maiden name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so So it's like yeah. multiple and this is my thing. I immediately noticed and I was like, wait, do you know them personally? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. First was the shock and I was like, no, you could never. You're like a little bit older than me, like 10, 15. Mm -hmm. If you know them, man, you know who like amazing people in politics. Yeah. But no, he didn't. And then I look. This was overseen by so many males, by so many men. Yeah. And nobody brought anything up. In the classroom, jokingly pointed it out. The professor acknowledged. She's like, oh, wow. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Today in class, I referred to one of the authors by her last name, which is Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. It's a female author, Hannah Santa Maria. Did they say he? No, 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 oh. no. It was like, who are you talking about? Because in the book, in the classroom, we refer to the authors of the book as the editor. He didn't acknowledge that article that is so important that we're talking about national security issues in relation to the Latin America wow. was written by a woman. Yeah. He did not know that. And I look at him and I'm like, the author, this it's Hema Santa Maria, it's not this mm -hmm. other people. Right? I'm not gonna <laughs> right. And he's like, I am I keep screwing up and I'm like Yeah, hey, yeah, you do. Yeah. It's, but at least, at least he's acknowledging it, and which is acknowledging hey. And it's amazing because again, I come with that same space to acknowledge the issues. Right. It's something as basic, as basic as it gets. But that's also emotional. Like, so why do I have to provide a safe space? <laughs> well, listen, it's, for it's, men, it's, it's a bigger conversation. <laughs> listen, it's a bigger conversation. How many of you in this room, in particular spaces, become the one that they turn to? 
when something that your racial profiling aligns with, right, comes I up can't in the even room. Imagine. Because if I had a dollar for every time I have been sitting in a classroom and something about Latino women comes up, something about queer women comes up, something about Cuban women comes up, and they and there's a, the Cuban part I'll accept because it's like, okay, it's my nationality. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, it's my origin. All right. You know, it's, it's specific. The lived experience is specific. All right. That far I'll, I'll sort of allow the tokenism to happen at times. Right. Cause it's geographic, but how many times are you pointed out without even a consideration for, do you Consent. even have that information or do, would you even want to go there? Like who, why what why do i have to take on the emotional toil right and the psychological weight of having to explain this to you right because you won't make the effort to find out yeah right you want the shortcut you want me to give you the explanation yeah. right it comes out it comes to and and this this whole conversation about so as a woman i get called by my first name right and then the men in the room get called professor all the time um, all the time that you know, and the only way to the only way to put an end to it is to become a broken record. That's the only way to to do that because the fact is that there's again it's so ingrained. Okay, guys, it's only a hundred years. It's only a hundred years, and in some places of the world, we're still property. Yeah. Okay. So the fact that we, you, and especially your generation, right? You guys, <laughs> you guys are, are writing the coattails, okay, of some really deep work that happened in the last 30 or 40 years, okay? And so it's very easy to forget what it was just 20 years ago, right? Or to not be aware of what it was just 20 years ago. So the, where does our responsibility lie? That's, that's the, the, the second question, right? Where does our responsibility then lie? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I post about it on social media, and personally, people say, like, oh, they don't know me. They don't know me. They don't know who they do. Mm -hmm. And then they just go into the group and they don't want to know who they do. Right. All that time, right? Uh huh. And that's multiple people. So, I feel like my group has been like, they're not informed at all, like, they don't have. Mm -hmm. Pretty much zero. Mm -hmm. And then, like, and then, then it becomes a decision. Right. Like, you know, but, like, if you're really aware of it, how do I say it? Like, if you're walking to um, your shirt and it's in there, then it's like, I know what I mean. That's my responsibility. Like, yep. I can have that. But it's mm -hmm. not a responsibility to be like, Absolutely. So, so, one of the things that I did during that time, because I, and, okay. Talk about intersectionality, right? I'm a white passing Cuban, and if anybody knows anything about that community, Lord knows this was a can of worms, right? Oh, Lord. So every time I started posting, it was like, excuse my language, shit show, right? So I turned to giving, I would post this about the sources. There, it, there, it, there came a moment where I was so tired of trying to explain myself or explain any of it that literally all my posts and all my stories were about, if you want to know this, check this out. If you want to know this, check this out. My white Cuban friends, please read this, okay? My white Cuban cousins, please read this, you know? <laughs> like, it, it literally, that's what it looked like I mean, like you also have stories. to think about it in the context of, imagine if Trump supporters were the only ones speaking for Americans, right? Or Democrats were the only ones speaking for Americans. That's not something, just because I'm a woman or just because I'm Cuban or just because I'm black or just because I'm Muslim, whatever it is, I don't have all the wealth of information of all my people. Exactly. I do not. But you know who does? The internet. <laughs> You're welcome. And what you can, I mean, one of, what, what else do you think is, is part of our responsibility? Like, what, do you, what else do you see as part of your responsibility? Because let's face it. Fact checking is an issue these days. Oof. So, what else do you think is is from your positioning? I feel like in terms of actually building, I'm, I'm not gonna be. Um, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be rude. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be rude and be like, oh, you really care about this. Or are you going to say bitch? Yeah, but, <laughs> but, you know what I mean? I guess representing what you believe. At least that's something that I've always been taught. To a certain degree, obviously. Like, if you're already, like, super friendly with a certain point, it's like, God, God, no. But uh, yeah. I think the method is different for everyone, but I think presentation of it is very Absolutely. How you, what you say is just as important as how you say it. If not, actually, how you say something is oftentimes more important than what you say. And that's the thing that we forget. Okay. That's the thing that we I forget, forget. all the time. Yes. I'm still working on that. Okay. This is why, this is why this happens. She's my balance. Um, it's, you know, it's really, it's really important how we structure things, right? The human brain works via association. We don't learn, in case you didn't know it, you don't learn anything that you don't know anything about. FYI. Okay? In order for you to capture totally new information, you have to hear it at least three times because your brain has to figure out what it's going to connect it to. Okay? We learn by association, which is why we learn things best by defining what it's not, which is also why we learn as children our motor skills by imitation. Okay? And I always tell the story of my mother has severe scoliosis and my dad had polio as a kid. Both my brother and my sister walk with a limp. There's nothing wrong with them. Okay. Wow. It was learning through, you know, I, I somehow escaped it, I guess through the dancing. It must have corrected itself, right? Yeah. But my, dad, my brother has nothing wrong with him, yet he walks exactly like my dad. Because we learn by imitation, right? So these, these spaces of then what do we say, what do we do, right? How do we call attention to it, okay? The first thing is making space for, for the other. Making space, as uncomfortable as it is, making space for the difference of opinion, right? And recognizing that there is a big difference between a difference of opinion and a lack of respect, okay? So understanding how those look, right? And I always say, lead with a question. Right? When somebody comes at you with an opinion that you're like, whoa, okay, wait a second, let me catch my breath here. Right? Instead of confronting it right head on, ask. Wow, that's interesting. Why? Because oftentimes you'll find that the why is not there. It was somehow passed down, right? And this is what we're talking about in this course. We go into, like I said, I very briefly, and I missed some things in between, so it probably sounded like, oh my God, what she's talking about. Um, there's this very clear line right? In how our contemporary society came to be and the way it's organized, right? And what that means for us as women, okay? And how that reflects for us as women. So, you know, the kinds and, you know, I want to end with another thing that we talk a lot about in the class is activism and what activism looks like, right? And activism can take many shapes, many, many shapes. Sometimes it's as simple as what happens inside your own four walls. Choose violence. <laughs> Sorry. Can't, can't, can't agree with that one. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a very, the, the home is a place that is often negated as, as, as a place of advocacy and as a place of, you know, activism. And we forget that that is also a product of the system that we live in, right? The fact that that is considered a separate space, right? that isn't attached to the stuff that goes on outside, outside the door is also what allows a history of homemakers not being, you know, women as homemakers not being valued and as caretakers and as a whole bunch of other things, right? So it's, it's multifaceted, it's multi-pronged, and every little bit counts as far as I'm concerned. And no, I don't, I choose not to choose violence, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> And if you have any questions or if you have any questions, the course will be repeated next spring with the internship opportunities again. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. One more time for these amazing speakers. Thank you so much for being here. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, I know I, I've, I've, 
feel that much more empowered and have made connections here that I've never made before. So I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, so that wraps up today's session. If you didn't get a chance to grab lunch, don't worry. There's still a few out there. You're more than welcome to get them. A reminder that all of our TTRs are also posted on YouTube. So this video will be posted likely within a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, if you want more of that information or you want to get a notification when that happens, feel free to shoot me an email at mixzaldi at fiu.edu. Otherwise, it was an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next week.